welcome and bienvenue. I am Andrea Davis, Academic Convener of Congress 2023. On behalf of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences and York University, I am delighted to welcome you, welcoming you, some of you again, um, but this time to the third Big Thinking event at the 92nd Congress of the Humanities and Social Sciences. Thinking across differences, queer, two-spirit, and critical disability perspectives. Today, S.A. Smythe, Tariq Pickens, and Alex Wilson will draw on their work in black poetics, critical disability studies, and two-spirit advocacy to consider what needs to happen if we are to begin the work of transforming our societies and the disciplines of the humanities and social sciences. They will be joined in conversation by moderator Sean Hillier. Today's event will take place in English and American Sign Language. We have also included French simultaneous interpretation and closed captioning in English and French. An ASL interpreter and closed captioning will appear on the screen on stage and on the Zoom screen for those of you joining virtually. To access simultaneous interpretation, if you need it, make sure you've downloaded the Sennheiser Mobile Connect application on your device, open the application, and click on the blue QR code at the top of the screen. Scan the QR code provided um, just outside the room. If you do need translation um, and you need some help, raise your hands and someone will be happy to come to help. And then you just select your preferred language and listen, press listen using your own earpiece. For those of you joining us virtually, you can click on the closed captioning button to enable captions. To use simultaneous interpretation, click on the interpretation button and select the language you would like to listen to. As I always do, I begin by marking the violent histories of where we are, making note of and reminding us of the ongoing conflicts and contradictions of this land, this water, this air. This acknowledgement is particular to T. Toronto. If you're joining us virtually, please take responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. Your university recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York's campuses are located that precede the establishment of York. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tikaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish With One Spoon, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Tikaranto's intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, indigenous peoples from other territories, as well as white settlers and those people who have come here by force or otherwise as a result of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and ongoing wars. As a descendant of Africans enslaved in Jamaica who were taken from their ancestral lands against their will, I am committed to what Tiffany King calls a notion of mutual care. And I recognize that a future for black peoples is not possible without a future for indigenous peoples by whose leave I live, walk on, and share this land. I acknowledge finally that these Americas are built on violence and erasure, and we bring these histories with us when we enter any room, any virtual space, and we must bring them always into view. With this knowledge of history, we've entered here again this afternoon 
in the hope of making a different world. The Big Thinking series at Congress brings together scholars and public figures to address some of the most pressing questions of our time. For Congress 2023, the series amplifies the theme of reckonings and reimaginings with conversations that honor indigenous knowledges and cultures, black and indigenous knowledges and cultures, and center diverse voices and perspectives. You can participate in the conversation on social media using the hashtag Congress, that is Congress with an H at the end. On behalf of the Federation and York University, I thank the CRE sponsors, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, and Universities Canada for sponsoring this event. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Please welcome Annie Pilot. Dean, Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies at the Université Laval, and Chair of the Board of Directors at the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, who will introduce today's lecture. Merci, Andrea. Thank you. C'est un plaisir d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. So it's going to be my first introduction in English, so I hope you'll bear with me on this. <laughs> so today, you are helping to make history. It's been four years since big thinking happened in person, and for the first time ever, the series has gone hybrid. So with folks at home joining us uh, in a room. Big thinking has a long history with the Federation. Beginning many years ago, as a series of lectures on Parliament Hill, to becoming mainstay at the annual Congress of Humanities and Social Sciences, and most recently transforming to a new podcast format. Across those different formats, this series has always been about sharing big ideas to shape the world of tomorrow. On behalf of the Federation, I would like to acknowledge our partners at York University for their vision, dedication, and hard work. It has been an honor and an inspiration to work alongside you in bringing this Congress to life. I also wish to express our sincere appreciation to the sponsors of the Big Thinking Series 2023, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, and Universities Canada. Your generous support has helped us make this event possible. Today's discussion features an incredible lineup of interdisciplinary scholars in conversation on the topic, thinking across differences, queer, two-spirit, and critical disability perspectives. This dialogue is about bringing together different lines of thought, not only to understand what these unique perspective, perspectives offer, but also to see how together they can help imagine a better, more inclusive, and more just future. At its heart, this is what Congress is all about, convening thinkers and sharing ideas across disciplines in the service of building a better world. I hope you will find this challenging and inspiring, and that it sparks new conversations and connections for you at Congress. Today's format is a panel discussion, and it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Sean Illier. Dr. Hillier is a queer Mi'kmaq scholar and a registered member of the Halipu First Nation. He is associate professor and New York Research Chair in Indigenous Health Policy and One Health in the Faculty of Health at York University. Dr. Hillier is also the interim director of the Center for Indigenous Knowledges and Languages and special advisor to the Dean of Health on Indigenous Resurgence. Merci d'avoir assisté à la causerie d'aujourd'hui. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Elliott to the stage, who will introduce you to our panelists, Dr. Tori Pickens, Dr. S.A. Smythe, and Dr. Alex Wilson. Thank you very much.
So Kwe, Ani, Tenzi, Bozu, Bonjou, and good afternoon. I'm honored to be joined by three amazing colleagues uh, who are world-leading thinkers in the discussions on queer, two-spirit, and critical disability perspectives. Today, we are here to reckon, also while we reimagine. But first, we must reckon with. We must reckon with how traditional understandings of gender were stripped from Indigenous people by church-led colonization. We must reckon with how Black and Indigenous bodies have been disabled. They've been disabled in all meanings of that word, whether through the construction of whiteness or the forced dislocation from our traditional lands, by being othered by the state that have allowed us to become police, institutional, and health statistics, or by having our traditional community kinship ties interrupted. We must also reckon with Black and Indigenous queer folks, especially our trans family, who have been erased from the history books, who are currently criminalized, who are being persecuted, and who face unimaginable violence each day just for existing. We must reckon with institutions that in one breath will speak of reconciliation and black inclusion, while in the next breath, excusing their lack of action based on policies and budget pressures. However, we are here today to also reimagine. We will and must reimagine a just future for all, one where we have our land, our languages, and our sovereignty back, one where climate change has been effectively addressed and curved, one where, in seven generations from now, our children do not resent the actions that we have taken today, one in which the bodies that we have are not policed, othered, and despised by those around us. It is a great pleasure to be your moderator for today's discussion on reckoning and reimagining from the perspectives of leading queer, two-spirit, and critical disability scholars who join me on stage today. I'll start with the introduction of our panelists with Dr. Thurie Pickens. Dr. Pickens wrote Black Madness, Mad Blackness in 2019 and New Body Politics in 2014. She has edited three volumes, Arab American Aesthetics, and has two special issues of academic journals on blackness and disability. She is also a Pushcart Prize-nominated poet. Dr. Pickens is a professor of English at Bates College. Next joining me on stage is Dr. Alex Wilson. Dr. Wilson from the Opaskwayak Cree First Nation is professor and former academic director of the Aboriginal Education Research Centre at the University of Saskatchewan. Her scholarship has greatly contributed to building and, sh and sharing knowledge about land-based education, two-spirited people, Indigenous research methodologies, and anti-oppressive education. And finally, Dr. S.A. Smythe. Dr. Smythe is a Black trans artist, a critical theorist, an educator, and a student of abolition. They are based between Toronto, Rome, and unceded Togna lands. Essay also uses they, them pronouns. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. <laughs> to start our discussion today, I would like to ask each of the panelists to reflect on your own research, your location in the academy, and on the lands in which you inhabit, and your experiences with queer, two-spirit, and or critical disability perspectives, and what possibilities, if at all, are there to work towards a just future? So with that, we will start with Dr. Pickens. Hi, everyone. Um, I am coming to you from the unceded territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy in the land known as Maine. Um, in the United States, so hi everyone. <laughs> um, I'm currently a full professor of English and soon to be chair of Africana uh, at Bates College. I think about my position in the academy as always a tenuous one. Um, I entered in the I entered into the academy at 16, um, deciding that I wanted to be a professor in my first year of college, 
And so it, this has been a kind of lifelong pursuit of knowledge, finally crystallizing in what I think are several questions for all of us to consider as we make our way through thinking about what it means to long for, uh, desire a more just future uh, that includes disability rather than erases it. Um, so I have a particularly profound distrust for linear narratives, um, narratives that rely on an understanding of time that is neatly delineated in seconds, minutes, hours, days uh, on a calendar that uh, some of us didn't all agree to. Um, and that distrust of linearity means that when I think about reckoning and reimagining, I am trying to reckon with the untold stories of the past, um, the smaller stories of the past, the easy narratives that are actually much more complicated and trying to imagine what those might look like uh, in a creative space, um, in a space that is attuned to justice. And so to that end, I like to take us back to the to March 2020. Um, I hope, you know, for anyone who is having a particularly traumatic experience right now, um, just thinking about that uh, that time, uh, I hope that you can kind of breathe through it. Um, I remember that um, March 13th was a Friday. Um, that feels very clear to me um, because the, the time that I was in was one of looking forward to a weekend. Um, my uh, work wasn't paused. Uh, because I was on sabbatical. So I was in this sort of suspended time period. And one of the stories that I heard was Brianna Taylor's story. And I tracked the story because she seemed like an avatar for me. Um, and I think there was something very difficult about watching the entire world react to George Floyd and erase this Black woman, um, erase other black women, um, erase trans folks, erase all of the violence that had been done. I was sort of wondering, um, as horrible as George Floyd's death was, was wondering why it was that that was the touchstone, that it was okay for other bodies, but not for this one. And so I've, I've always wrestled with knowing the violence that is there and also trying to reckon with what it means to pull back up into consciousness, these stories about, um, about people who are often erased. So uh, I wanna read a piece that I wrote for Breonna Taylor, uh, for all of us. And this is both, I think, for me, a reckoning and reimagining. On March 12th, 2020, Breonna Taylor awakened after working four overnight shifts at the local ER with its loud flashes and staccato lights, a hustle she said was going to make 2020 the year of Brianna Taylor, and it is. A beautiful thing that she and Kenny did what all young couples should get the chance to, that is, spend the day just chilling, chat at supper time over decent barbecue, that is the best you can get outside family, and decide between playing high stakes Uno or watching a movie, what all young couples should get the chance to do, to get the chance to when they don't choose and do both as they munch freshly baked cookies and ice cream. That is the warm dough hugging the cold sugar wet before the movie starts watching them curled up in bed and not know what no young couple should get the chance to. That is what interrupts their feeling of justice of just us, what all waits outside their love. So since you can't see the poem, there are a couple of things that I wanna point out. It's a drop title. So the title is part of the poem and it's all one sentence. And so I'm patterning it after um, a poem called A Small Needful Fact by Ross Gay that was written about Eric Gardner. So I'm in conversation 
with other um, moments of Black death, other moments of Black reimagining and, and reckoning than the U.S. And uh, I also focused on these her last hours. Um, so I wanted to give back in poetic form her life, um, the part that she is or who she is before that terror. And so that's, I think, one way to kind of reckon and reimagine, um, to think through what the past has done and try to imagine what it could have done or to focus on the parts of it that are um, that are actually quite beautiful. Um, I think at the time I was also concerned about how um, there was all of this focus on Black death and um, what that inevitably did was create Blackness, create um, a version of Blackness that was tethered to violence. So uh, I'm not sure where I'm at on time. How am I doing, Sean? Four minutes. Okay, great. So I have time to read another poem. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and and this one is, is uh, also pulling backwards, sort of pulling from Gwendolyn Brooks because it's a golden shovel poem and also trying to think through what a usefully cranky, um, perhaps sort of, I told you so, um, angry um, version of uh, Black disability consciousness during the pandemic. Because I think for me, <laughs> and um, I don't know what it was like for anyone else um, similarly situated, but I got a lot of calls asking, was I okay? Um, as a disabled Black woman, like people started to think about what my life must be like because they were then experiencing it too. And um, I think part of my concern was, I'm fine because this is my normal. You all are not fine. Like you ables are not fine because this is the first time you've had to reckon with this. So this is a piece that I wrote trying to kind of think through what I understand to be a particular disability consciousness, a particularly Black disability consciousness, and also something that was unwilling to do the kind of work that uh, our and Dottie Roy was doing uh, when she called pandemic the pandemic a portal. I was like, uh, I don't know what window you're looking in, um, oh, brilliant essayist. <laughs> um, but the window that I'm looking through is is only going to be more tragic for people like me. So this poem is called Variation on a Theme. Um, we tired, two syllables, no R. We real tired because we tried to listen for real, for real. Cool, not for play, play. We kept our cool. We keep trying to save ourselves. We left our own selves behind in case things went left. School must reopen, they say. We can't reopen school. We keep other folks and other things in mind. We lurk in our homes and behind masks, lurk late at night in our trembling thoughts. Lately, we think about all the kinds of work we do. Strikes seem a good idea. Back in the day, striking straightened up a company, so here's some straight talk. We telling you, we feel this apocalypse in our bones. We sing to thee of shine and his hustle. We be singing sinfully all them low notes about keeping a peace since we know ain't nobody thinking about us. We thin boned and called essential, a lie so thin, genuine care slips through, plus vermouth, lemon, bitters, gin. We toast the inevitable because we know we jazz up the coming breathlessness. We listen for March jazz in June. We've been in the house since March, it's June. We know there may not be an end, for if we must die, we choose which monster murders us. Some of us will die soon. Many of us will die soon. Um, uh, it's a golden shovel piece because it models itself after one of Gwendolyn Brooks's poems um, called The Golden Shovel. <laughs> and so, I think one of the things I was trying to do was give people a sense of uh, what it might mean to both open up uh, Gwendolyn Brooks's work, as well as to open up her powers of observation 
from a particularly black disability perspective, a black disabled perspective. Um, and this is, I think, the final thing I'll say that when I think about what it means to reckon and reimagine, um, I think about what it means to reckon with a past that, um, that requires that we shrink the humanity of some people in order to acknowledge the humanity of others and also try to reimagine both a past and a future that is more just um, and that is not only uh, just inclusive, right? Not that litany of identity, um, but that facilitates belonging. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Pickens, for your opening words. Two beautiful poems to start us out, and we will now move back into the theater um, and have opening comments from Dr. Wilson. Thank you, and thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to be here. Tansi Wasanas and Tisnigasan, Pamaskatapan o Pasquiak o Chinina. So that describes where I'm from, the Pasquiak Cree Nation, which is on the Saskatchewan River Delta system. <clears throat> and the Saskatchewan River Delta is one of the largest freshwater inland deltas on the planet. And um, just to kind of describe the situation there so that you can Google it after and maybe think about what's happening in your own territories as well, is that our territory has been impacted by clear cutting and by the impact of Manitoba Hydro and Sask Power and other um, corporations like Ducks Unlimited. And, um, and then, as I mentioned, clear cutting. So right now we're kind of at the nexus of all these environmental issues that are not only impacting our land, but also parallel processes that are happening on um, the bodies of the people that live there. And uh, just to give an example of that, uh, in our territory, we have a huge housing crisis in my community. We're short about 880 houses, which means like, um, not just 880 people, but, you know, thousands of people. And um, our wood is being chopped down to make special craft paper, which produces, um, it's unique because it's strong and uh, long fibers that are especially desirable for pet food bags and uh, cement food bags. So instead of being able to use the logs in our community for houses, we have to ship out for, for other things like pet food bags. So it kind of shows like how colonial economics have um, been linked to and support an ideology that has impacted not just land. And when I say land, I mean everything that's connected to land, water, air, everything, and including us as people. And so um, that is kind of where my research began uh, a long time ago, uh, because of the way that the bodies were impacted, and, and as you mentioned in the intro, uh, certain bodies impacted in kind of asymmetrical ways, and those usually the bodies of uh, queer people. And in particular, the way that, um, that we saw it manifesting was through violence, but also internalized um, in suicide rates. So that's what first compelled me to really look at, um, like, why is this happening over and over again? And, um, you know, so started looking at, at uh, how researchers were describing gay and lesbian indigenous people. And that's the terminology that was used at the time. And um, so this is one of the things that has changed over, over the decades. The terminology has changed but the suicide rates haven't changed. Um, so there's, there's a bit of movement, but then there's also something that's happening that um, keeps us in this kind of cycle that, that is um, manifesting over and over again. And we're seeing it right now with the banning of rainbow flags and in Saskatchewan, um, banning children from going into the rainbow tent at a children's festival and um, you know increased violence against trans and queer people. Um, so, because of the kind of um, time and place that we're at right now, um, it really necessitates an understanding of how we connect with one another, but also with the planet. And um, we know that the severing of 
knowledge or the severing of land-based knowledge uh, known as epistemicide um, has really impacted us as Indigenous people. Uh, but as um, Rebecca Sock Beeson, who's a Penobscot scholar, says the epistemicide is not complete. So really, we're at a time now where um, we're, um, a, an ontological shift is ne necessitated, and Munoz talks about that, and Joshua Russell as well, that there's, needs, there's a need for an ontological humility, really. And uh, for me and other Indigenous scholars, I think that's already built right into our language, which is a reflection of our worldview, our ideology, and our belief system. And in particular, you know, this notion as self in relation, um, we can see it as a shift to self as relation. And it, this all makes sense within Cree. Um, and, you know, my dad has taken and has been so patient with me <laughs> during my whole life to try and explain this one concept. And I think I'm finally trying, almost getting it. <laughs> um, and this concept of self in relation, as relation and what that means. So when I introduced myself in Cree, that was um, um, a representation of self as relation because it literally says where your umbilical cord is attached to the earth. And that means that we are a part of something and we're not just in relationship with it. And um, so in the, all of that, there's a level of accountability that kind of goes to a, um, the broader cosmological reason of, of why we're even here as energy beings, I guess. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about that, but then also... Um, a way that uh, people in our communities are trying to undo epistemicide through reconnecting with land. And so many of you might know that Indigenous land-based education, in not just in North America, but elsewhere, has become like increasingly popular, like almost wildly popular, <laughs> and to the point where um, this is almost kind of a danger zone, because like, what, what exactly is land-based education? And um, while there's power in it, there's also a danger, and, and what's happening is often now we're reifying colonial systems and ideologies now just in a land-based form. So we're taking whatever we've done in the colonial system education and then just taking it outside, and um, that, that's not exactly working right. It's just reinforcing the status quo. So I like to draw from the work of um, my friend and Kanaka Mali scholar, Kalani Young, who says that um, queering is transforming poison into medicine. So I really see um, this hopefulness and this opportunity we have with um, queer scholarship, but also with like the verb, literally queering, to help understand um, how we can transform poison. Poison being that like kind of trap of colonialism, the ideology of colonialism, by um, transforming into uh, medicine. And I think there's many ways that people are doing that through their scholarship, but also connecting it to actions. And, and one of those is um, the Two-Spirit movement itself. So initially, Two-Spirit referred to gay and lesbian native people, again, because that was the terminology at the time. And um, the term has, has shifted over time as our... As our um, access to and also our ability to be heard from our own indigenous languages and understandings of, of not just gender but also sexual diversity and then also connection to land. Um, so that's, that's what the term is kind of meaning today in, in my understanding anyway. And it's not just about people but it's about the movement. So it's an individual identity but also a movement. And then as part of that, um, the theory of coming in as well. I think is a way that people are, are um, manifesting self as relation because uh, queer indigenous people to spirit people have kind of, um, I, I don't wanna say reclaim because we've always had our identities, but it's a way to insist that others maybe listen, that, um, that we're connected to land and um, in, in all the ways that are not just intellectual, but on a spiritual level as well. And so coming in as a way to um, 
verbalize or create community or relations in a way that is creating and life-giving rather than life-taking. So, Kenan Askman. Thank you uh, for those opening comments, Dr. Wilson. Ferns, the ferns have taken over uh, the stage. Uh, my, my, if they were mine, they would have died. Uh, I'm not like great <laughs> at the house plant uh, item. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Wilson, for for that opening and, and the connection of land-based education, but also land-based healing for queer, two-spirit, indigenous peoples, and the, the amount of work I do in the HIV sector with queer, two-spirited folks, and the importance of reconnecting that land, not just as education, but truly as healing, is so foundationally important. So thank you for those words. Mm -hmm. We'll now move over to Dr. Smythe for mm -hmm. your opening comments. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm enjoying being between two ferns, and... <laughs> These people are on the internet. <laughs> um, and just really honored and not at all stressed <laughs> to follow Dr. Fickens um, and Dr. Wilson. Um, I'm mindful of time and um, I just want to throw this somewhere. I'm just really moved by the, the conversation. I do also have to thank um, Professor Davis for um, convening us. Um, the correlation is really quite strong. Um, and it's, I just want to stress to the audience, um, with whom I refuse to make eye contact, um, <laughs> but stress to the audience, you know, it's not just because of uh, the convening of the other. Right, but perhaps rather um, maybe in the vein of the ecology of thought of what someone like Toni Morrison offered us in terms of um, rather than bringing the periphery over into the center, it is speaking from where we're speaking and the center organizes around us because um, that is how we um, view the world. She said it much more um, aptly and with a, a gravitas. Um, but I wanted to sort of begin there um, by way of locating myself and um, with a few minutes here to say something maybe quite literal, which is locating myself physically on this land, you know, moving from Dr. Pickens, talking about the we, which I want to come back to, um, thinking about, uh, I mean, just the various cosmologies you've offered us just now, um, and thinking about queering as a verb, which has me think about language and languaging. Um, I'm new to this land, um, to this part of Abiyayala, of Turtle Island, um, and uh, when called by this panel to think about how I locate myself here, um, I thought about that fact in literal terms, which is to say, prior to this I was living in Italy, I was living in Rome, prior to that, Tongva land. Um, which you can look up if you're not familiar with the Gabrielino Tongva people um, on the west coast of, of, of this rock. Um, I'm here because of 2020, and I feel really quite clear about that. Um, the people with whom I was in conversation um, when thinking about accepting this position, um, we're not recording, are we? The people who I was in conversation with when thinking of accepting a position at the University of Toronto, um, where I now work, um, were also very clear what it meant for me, a black person not from these lands, to be recruited to the position that I now have as assistant professor of black studies and the archive. Um, you know, 2020 means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Um, it, for me, represents a sort of convergence of ecological catastrophe, of the um, resurgence of a framework of crisis, which many of us know by another name, like history. Um, here in Toronto, we, have, we had the murder in May. We don't even have to go through the 12 months. I only have four minutes left. Um, May 2020, where we saw, of course, the murder of George Floyd, which reverberated transnationally um, with very little care and attention, oftentimes, to the life that that grounding, that that man had, um, and the uh, voids left in his wake, in the wake of his physical absence, and how that 
became rendered transnational along similarly imperial colonial routes, where people in their own lands and their own contexts and tongues were um, rendered absent by that same metric. Here in Toronto, of course, there was um, Regis Cochinsi Packet um, two days after the murder of George Floyd. Um, I, I believe 11 or 12 days prior to that um, was the discovery of 216, um, the remains of 216 people, um, uh, native peoples from this land who were discovered um, possibly murdered, rendered missing, rendered absent from time. Um, all of these things happened, as we know, the ongoing global pandemic. Um, and I'm here in the wake of that moment, and it's something that um, I think about um, with some of the same ambivalence I heard from Dr. Pickens in terms of my role in the academy. Um, that said, it's obviously not nothing to be a black woman full professor on those United States. Um, as well as here, you know, people talk to me about um, what it meant, that same exporting gesture that we saw with George Floyd's life and um, his murder and uh, its afterlives and the ongoing afterlives of coloniality and other iterations of genocide that we asymmetrically experience. We know what it means that um, people are saying Sandra Bland and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor in places like Italy or Tangier or Uganda or London, um, the United Kingdom, uh, instead of saying the names that we also know to hold on our tongues. There's a similar impetus, I'd wager, that has me here um, and not uh, black Canadian people, black indigenous Canadian people, people that are forging against all odds to converge and coalesce their stories into something that might nominally be named black studies, but otherwise memory work. Um, on these lands. And so um, I'm going to pause it there, but I do want to just sort of, oh, I, I will say maybe one other quick point. Um, just, it's more than an acknowledgement, but rather a locating of myself to say what I'm learning from the people that I've met, first of all, coaching me into making the decision to be here and thinking about the weight of what it would mean, um, thinking more expansively about migration, which is something that I research and work on, and migrancy um, as an immigrant to this land in relation to settler coloniality in this land with my own um, histories of black and presences of blackness, histories of, uh, and presences of blackness and Afro-indigeneity, um, from lands that circulate also uh, along roots of coloniality, which is to say um, imperialism, like Jamaica, um, like Costa Rica, um, and Central America broadly, where the Garifuna people um, call home. Um, and so in my work, I think about that location question that we were organized around today, to think about um, those realities, how to bear those weight, that weight, how to be in good relation. And one of the vehicles that I um, would love to circle back to on the next round is the attention to language, um, which people like um, Audre Lorde, Tony Cade Bambara, um, and Judith Butler have said always fails us. Um, but we are also then still yearning and organizing ourselves into um, not new tongues, not novel tongues, maybe to reference Dion Brandt for a moment, um, but rather, and I think this is something that you were speaking of too, not, there's not a newness in our approach, but rather a, a reorientation, which I agree is not the same as a reclamation, but acknowledging what once was, and that the very thing that I started off talking about as crisis, um, history, how it has warped and rearticulated us, we can, through another kind of languaging, another kind of relationality, another kind of fellowship, um, reordain those networks um, that have been purposed against us. Excellent. Thank you for those opening words. Making a moderator job very easy by already throwing me uh, things you would like to turn back to. Um, but I really want to keep the discussion uh, going, and I, I, have lots, I have lots of questions prepared on all my cue cards here, but in, in the idea of the big thinking format and to be in conversation with, I'd like to pass it back now to the panelists to give you all a chance to comment and engage with one another with what you've said through these introductory remarks before we move in to some of my formal questions. So if anybody would like to start us off.
this is, this is exactly what I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Such great questions. No? Okay, perfect. So we're going to jump in. They, they already know what's coming. Perfect. So we're going to move into uh, the first... Did you want to, Dr. Pickens, did you want to? Yeah, I oh. was going to say something belatedly. Um, I think that part of what's offered here um, is an entirely new way of thinking about relation for some people. Um, and I'm, I'm remembering what it is like to kind of humble oneself. Mm -hmm. I saw um, what... Um, what was called kind of ontological humility mm -hmm. and what it means to recognize that the thing you call your city um, may not actually be its name, to recognize that the, um, the things that, that you've taken for granted, like the, you know, um, I guess pet food bags, um, are also... Uh, part of someone someone else's story in a way that that isn't necessarily um, just or um, and that and that is violent um, and I appreciate the kind of alternate names that were given to history and black studies memory work and um, I forget what the one was for history but um, this this idea that what we're calling something um, can reorient us, but also has a limited degree of power, um, especially if the circumstance itself doesn't change and the language is the only thing that changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've all discussed in your works in, uh, in, in forms today um, the ideas around space. Space is time, space as a place, space is land, space is language, space is power. So how do you see this conversation changing from within the academic discourse that's currently taking place? And how are you engaging with that uh, within your respective institutions? I think it's a really important topic because, um, <clears throat> you know, Linda Smith in Decolonizing Methodologies, you know, which was in the... Um, couple of decades ago now, I guess, um, talks about time and space in terms of Indigenous cosmology. And I, it's a, just a little brief section in that book, but it's so important because I think in our own languages and understandings and worldviews, um, um, you know, Dr. Pickett's talked about linear time. Uh, that has been so transformed and such a part of institutional time uh, mm -hmm. that it's really hard to to switch um, but I, I honestly do think that it's entirely possible to center um, indigenous knowledge and to center like to invert hegemony right mm -hmm. and I think that's what we're trying to do in these panels is centering black and indigenous knowledge systems and part of that has to be about time and space and architecture and all those things that that involve time and space and um, like the you know, from sociology, institutional time compared to real time, you know, that's one of the biggest things right now for us coming out of like the pandemic and that, that time, that era of linear time that completely shifted everything, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think some of the answers are in indigenous uh, notions of time and space. And um, that's what I'm trying to like prod my dad for now too. <laughs> I'll keep you posted. <laughs> I think we're all very much looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. um, I go big or go home. <laughs> I, the, the, the thing that came to mind, thank you for inviting me to this Congress. Um, the thing that came to mind, you know, I mean, I appreciate the question because it really gave me a chance to like, attend to it and then reflect um, really with my co-panelists. And um, just going back again to Dr. Pickens talking about, I'm saying ambivalence, but that's not how, she, that's not the word she used. Um, but this sort of feeling of you know, being a full professor and also like the work that needs to be done and the other kinds of work and the mediums that um, she really grounded us with here. I'm um, an assistant professor, so my time in the institution is at the, the base rung 
um, of a 10-year stream towards then tenure, towards full, towards that moment when I could be Angela Bassett with the car in the back. And there's something that I really... <laughs> there's something about that um, that um, I... I'm coming closer and closer to sort of rejecting outright because it already preconditioned a rejection of me and all of my communities and things that I hold dear. Um, and so I want to just put that on the table, especially if there are any grad students or younger folk watching and, and attending to this moment. The way that institutions have us doing time, and I use that term advisedly, is particularly a reordering of the actual thing, I can't say time there, um, that is needed for us to take time to be in right relations with one another, right? The way that things are speeding up is really just a parallel mirroring. It's a one-to-one, -one. it's a circle on a Venn diagram of um, what needs to be done, which is that we take time, we slow down, um, and um, and that's not the same thing, I think, when you're talking about, you know, the self and rest. It's not, you know, the, the not bastardized, the, the ruination of Audre Lorde's self-care, but actually acknowledging the self as a communal apparatus and saying, who do I need to be in relation? How long will it take? Um, and I think about that in spatial terms as well with my work, for example, in theorizing and organizing with uh, black people, people of African descent, um, and uh, indigenous people in a European context, or Roma and Sinti travelers um, in the Mediterranean, thinking blackness in the Mediterranean where um, sometimes languages aren't represented and you need to take time to understand how to communicate. You need to sort of take time to think about um, what my dear friend Ashan Crowley has talked about is otherwise possibility and different modes of relation. I realize I might be speaking quite quickly. And so um, the way that I do that, just to like round out that question, is by trying not to do time. Um, I know that there is phenomenal research and scholarship happening. I hope I'm a part of that within the institution TM, but I think we all, it would behoove us to then also acknowledge that because we are human beings, which is a point of contention for some, um, how we are in community and in relation beyond the institution is precisely the raw material that institutions use to bolster their ivory tower. And so if we're already doing the temporal work of being in relation and in community beyond those apparatuses, that is how I try to do my work. Um, and, um, you know, fingers crossed because Canada has nominal health insurance more than where I was previously, that I don't get sort of booted or like there are repercussions for that, but actually being held by community um, and knowing that the work I do matters in material sense beyond the sort of checks and balances of how many years and how many courses um, do I go along through um, is the way that I continue to locate myself in time to make sure that you know, my ancestors are proud and that my mother, um, who has a high school degree, knows what it is that I'm doing, even if she doesn't know all the words. Thank you. Yeah, just to add to that, I think that <laughs> space pretty virtually. Um, I think about the fact that my space is shrunken, um, not just by virtue of where I can go physically because of disability, but also where I feel welcome ideologically because of said disability. Um, and also, you know, because of the other facets of my identity. Um, I think ambivalent is definitely one of the words I'd use. Okay. Cranky, irritated. Um, <laughs> I read the book. Uh, just some of the other ones. Um, I think I oscillate between feeling like the academy has everything to do with the rest of the world because we traffic in the space of ideas um, and also the same personalities, systems that you find in other professions, you also find in the academy. Um, and then also I think about the way that I have been pulled from um, the home that I know in New Jersey to be at UCLA on Tongva land um, across Turtle Island and then also pulled again back across, but also north. Um, I don't have family where I'm at. I have no community to, um, to hold me in the way that, uh, in the way that I think it, kind of any person needs. 
Um, sure, there are individuals, right? Um, I don't want any of you to get the impression that like I'm here all alone. Um, but the kind of community that you get when you are tethered to a land and a place, tethered to space, um, makes you feel, or makes me feel rather quite rootless. So I think, you know, trying to create space because that's also like part of the way that we are talking about space these days. Sometimes that space is virtual. Um, so, you know, kind of existing in Zoom uh, for, um, for me, at least the foreseeable future. Um, and then sometimes the creation of that space is the, um, the modes and methods by which we use language and um, things like invitation and hospitality in a space to allow for someone to, to just enter. Um, I think the, the, the bothersome nature of lacking space is that by the time you're actually in a space, you've had to go through a whole bunch of mental and sometimes physical gymnastics to get there. And so I'm thinking, I'm thinking not only about that in terms of ramps, elevators, signage, language, but also, um, you know, <laughs> whether or not that space is predicated on your erasure, uh, as was um, as was already mentioned. Um, so I mean, the, the academy is a is a violent space. Um, it does feel like. Uh, doing time because you you're shipped away from your community um, kind of pumped for all of your information and you're you're stuck uh, a little bit um, uh, especially on the uh, on the tenure stream um, <clears throat> uh, but there's also possibility like you can create some resistance space in between that um, in that small area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So unfortunately our time is almost complete. Uh, mm -hmm. However, I would like to take the last moments and uh, ask if Dr. Smythe would be willing to share a poem that they have uh, with mm -hmm. us before I invite Dr. Davis back. Mm -hmm. I thought I thought you were letting me out when he said that we were at time. Um, wonderful. Yes. Yeah, so I wrote something, uh, and if uh, you don't like it, I can't see you. So um, <laughs> I'm also super honoured because Dr. Fickin started us off with some phenomenal poetry. So this is um, it has no name, but let's give it uh, the seasons a litany. That's the title, um, and it's. Uh, so it won't take too long to read, and it's really um, a sort of meditation. I didn't really get to speak so deeply because I thought Dr. Pickens really <laughs> said it all in practice about, um, I think, what we've all been talking about in terms of black and indigenous transformation, disability, transness, which is something I, I think really deeply about, um, and an attention to language. One thing, um, as a quick aside, is because I just wanted to make sure I'm on the stage, and so while people can hear my voice, um, an attention to language um, means uh, one concrete example is to think about how things are counted and accounted for, and whether we think that's the same thing as accountability. Uh, maybe one quick thing that we can do in the future, it's like when you say a the word the first time, you see it everywhere. Think about when you hear the phrase bodies, black bodies, native bodies, um, Note when that happens and when we say that instead of black people, native people. And so, what did I call it? Seasons, a litany. What do you want? A litany? We have nothing but. One steady beam of a Coast Guard's boats, seven and twenty nations, and sixteen more besides. That's three and forty ships, if you're following. All turns away, antagonizing sundials, dismissing three and forty calls on their muted alarm phones, careening towards one last gasp of a binary algorithm to one last new normal. Zero for life, one for death. Forty-three dropped anchors safely behind their forty-three invisible lines. We've learned their count, you see. 
four vessels, 12 score and 14 bodies, perhaps men, perhaps women and younger men, smaller women and even smaller men and women smaller still. And no one, not one person to give a damn how much hotter it's getting. One degree by one degree by one. How many miles they've been walking or crawling or suckling in the case of the smaller men. The wee small men still wet behind the ears who would not so much remember this day as become it. Two. There are four parts, I didn't mention that. Meanwhile, across the same sea, bracing against the nerve of four and twenty ships, twelve and twenty canoes, fourteen tons of mud and birch, five million sets of hallowed bones set with deer hide, eighteen hundred kiloliters of oil in three-fifths as many barrels, sixty guilders of beads and jewels, eleven treaties, then seven, then three and ten more, or nine, were trained to lose count. After two and forty months, the coronavirus becomes a U.S. citizen, changes the subject to avoid being the subject, begs you not to shoot, assimilates its leaden lungs alongside lead lunches, lead bloodstreams, lead water, lead walls buckling under lead-bound books, spits up mountains of sacred rock, gathers up the hem of its thoughts and prayers to pledge allegiance on a stack of piss-poor Hollywood signs and flags and Bible verses is today years old before realizing how to protect itself, crosses the street when looking at black people, compliments another one's accent to shed the bias in its skin. Three, we did not become the instant we left home, heaving tools to forge our future in the world, a cleaver smooth as water, a knife quick as wit, an oven cast in night. When our fathers first left our house, we studied those tools and asked, Dare we make a home with these? How could we, the left behind, learn how to braise and chop and cut the same way we number or name all the sense our hands already knew? We've been, will be. In the clearing, our mothers taught us the worth of a word so not just anyone could wander through our doors. We've always known when to speak, what to do, if not how to language, how to body the score. Our songs are sharp and storied and dark, the rivers spilling off our already liquid tongues into an ocean rising underneath us, our vessels, and any prison house that tries to keep us from our own. Four. I've come to find that my body has already wrought me into a man who questions, has forced me into the question, has forged me into the question, and fastened the question against the man, even the smaller men. We call them children here. To hell with the count. We have us, a harness geometry, that is to say, a measurement of the earth beyond the earth. We witness daily the small unbridled whispers of possibility and embers of that liberatory joy. Thank you. Yeah. My heartfelt thanks to the panelists and invite closing remarks. Thank you so much um, to our panelists, um, S.A. Smythe, Thierry Pickens, Alex Wilson, and our moderator, Sean Hillier, for that beautiful and provocative conversation. I want to thank again our sponsors, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, the Canada Foundation for Innovation and Universities Canada for their support. If you would like to revisit the conversation today, the video will be available on the Congress virtual platform in the coming days until June 30. Today's lecture is a third of the Big Thinking events at Congress, the final Big Thinking lecture, Reimagining Black Futures by the Right Honorable Mikhail Jean, will take place tomorrow at the same time um, and the same place. Please continue the conversation in your scholarly associations in the social tent and on your campuses. If you're indigenous, black, or racialized and need a space to reflect, we have gathering spaces for indigenous scholars in the Center for Indigenous Student Services and the Center for Indigenous Knowledges and Languages in York Lanes for black scholars in the Harriet Tubman Institute, also in York Lanes, and for black indigenous people and of color scholars in the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean on the eighth floor of the Kenef Tower. 
Please continue to participate in the conversation on social media using the hashtag Congress, that is Congress with an H at the end. We're also inviting you to fill out a short survey on your experience at today's lecture. Using your mobile device, you can scan the QR code on the screen behind me or on the signs posted at the door. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Please enjoy the rest of your time at Congress. Merci, miigwech.